Thank you so much, Stephen. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Um, okay, so in the next hour, we will be talking about, as you can see from this title, uh, it's the relational philosophies and ethical diversity in the intercultural evolution of AI ethics, a disruptive conversation. Um, uh, first of all, I would say that um, uh, you know three. There's, there were three panelists. One is you can see on the screen, Professor Sakula Osamu uh, Sakula. He's actually in South Korea doing his uh, field research. Uh, um, unfortunately, he cannot join us in person. And then he he's the uh, he's a professor at the University of Tokyo, focusing on the sort of intersection of science, technology, and society. Okay, that's his field. And then um, we have uh, uh, Peter Hershock. Um, he's a professor from the University of Hawaii. He heads up the uh, East-West Center uh, at the University of Hawaii. He's a prominent uh, uh, Buddhist philosopher. Um, and then uh, Robin Wong, and he's a professor from uh, uh, Loyola uh, Mount Mary University uh, in Los Angeles. She's been teaching Taoism for decades uh, in the United States. So uh, we'll have this uh, really three uh, interesting thinkers and philosophers joining our panel. Um, this panel is really, uh, we, we had a number of discussions offline. It's a truly a collaborative uh, exercise um, based on the group, the, uh, group discussion. Actually, Peter came up with this very sophisticated, <laughs> deep title for this uh, panel. And, um, uh, and then so this panel really speaks to uh, one of the uh, key motivations of this conference, I would say, which means we want to explore ontological, epistemological, and axiological differences in thinking about AI ethics. So uh, uh, so this panel will be focusing on more philosophical and cultural angles. Uh, how we're going to proceed is maybe perhaps we start with what relational philosophies are all about. This is sort of the key concept, key notion we would like to introduce to the audience uh, at this panel. So maybe we start with this, uh, you know, a couple, uh, maybe from, from Peter and then Robin, let's let's just, you know, share your thoughts about what are the key aspects, you know, of relational philosophies and what does that mean, okay? And then we will follow, uh, we, we'll have uh, presentations by three of them, starting with uh, Professor Sakula and then Robin and then Peter, okay? So that's how we're gonna proceed at this panel. So. First, first thing first, what do you mean by um, relational philosophies? Uh, I tend to come at relational philosophies, uh, um, was just mentioned from a Buddhist perspective. It could just as easily come from any number of different indigenous perspectives, from a Confucian perspective, Ubuntu, which we heard about yesterday in song. But from at least a Buddhist perspective, the minimal commitments of relational philosophy is that you first of all take relationality as ontologically basic. That is, relationality is more basic than things related, and all things, whether these are, we're talking about events, whether we're talking about subatomic particles, whether we're talking about human beings, whether we're talking about galaxies, these all only exist independently through a process of excluding what is other. It's a conceptual process by means of which individual existence come into being. Prior to that, everything is relational all the way down. So the first commitment is that, to seeing relationality as constitutive, not as contingent. The second commitment from a Buddhist perspective, and this is an important one, is to realize that relationality is dynamic, and in causal terms, nonlinear causation is always more basic than linear causality. That it's always network-like, that causation plays out looping over time. So causation operates at different scales, so different temporal spatial scales, and it's always a recursive process, not a simple linear process. And the advantage of thinking that way is that then you start to see that what in Western terms, in quotes Western ethics terms, ever referred to as agents, actions, and patients, and the environments within which they're deciding and, and acting, that that really is a, a single relational whole that is complexly evolving over time and can only be evaluated by looking at it complexly over time. So from a relationalist perspective, I think that what we're looking at with relational philosophy is to make a move much like what happened with the Copernican revolution. Copernican revolution decenters humanity and the cosmos, 
relational philosophy decenters the individual metaphysically, epistemologically, and ethically. And uh, you know, yeah, um, Peter said all, and uh, um, I'm. I think I'm giving um, another a quick statement about the relational cell, uh, relational philosophy, and I think it's better to give also the images. So, um, for we can see um, the images I have give, uh, presented. This is from 200 AD. Um, about the story how world started. So there is three important um, ideas I want to see. First, on your left, uh, on your left, that's the female uh, called the uh, Niwa. And uh, then the right is the male kind of Fuxi. It's a father and the mother's of Chinese culture. So you can see there is interrelationality. It's interrelated. You cannot have a only male um, principle or female principle to make all things uh, begin. So you have to interrelate it. Secondly, these images, you can see the top is a human and the body is a snake. And the humans and the animals and all things are interrelated. Thirdly, you can see both are holding something that hold the technology. In 200 AD, right, so female hold uh, uh, a new hold campus. It's look at the uh, uh, heavens, and the male look at uh, hold the square to measure the uh, earth. So heaven is round, earth is a square. Uh, heaven, and then we should understand. And the behind that is the cosmos. So this is a give a statement what a relational philosophy is. First of all, it's a critique. A critique of the philosophical, another philosophical view that the substance being always isolated. But everything, there is no isolated things, beings, a substance. Secondly, a it's a metaphysical framework to think about in the fundamental level, everything is interrelated, in interdependent and interdetermined. The thirdly, this is a epistemological approach. So it's not that we are not thinking about thing, either or all, right or wrong, black or white, but rather the both and. So uh, this is seeing the relationship, how when we look at the things, how we use a holistic view to look at. Of course, this relational philosophy also question about human knowledge, human understanding. There is limits to human understanding. And then, can I do a second? Okay, in this one. Oh, and then quickly, because uh, connectivity and the relationality is the key to relational philosophy. Then how we do it? Now, how do we really grasp these relationships? So now we can see perhaps there's different way to do it, but I just picked up three things. So the variables. So one is rhythm. Then we use yin yang as examples. There are things that could be too fast or too slow. And another one is balance. So we have a different, uh, um, uh, elements into play, some is too much, too aggressive, or some is too little and too passive. Then third one is the transformation because the relationality lead to change and the generation and the transformation. So this is how I think we, we, we understand the relationality. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Peter and Robin. So this is like an uh, uh, eight-minute cram course on relational philosophies. And then what I picked out is things like relationality. That's the ontological basis, okay? It's not a standalone, self-contained, particular one thing or essence. So that's actually key ontological kind of uh, 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 assumptions that we should keep in mind. And then and then in relation actually, you know, speaks to things that were sort of constituent, uh, constituent rather than contingent. So it's not something you can pick and choose. I want to be related to Peter. I want to be related to Robin. We are from day one. Okay. And then also I, I hear the keywords about decenters individuals. And then Robin uses a wonderful uh, uh, ancient uh, picture to talk about the interrelated, this interrelationality among human beings, between humans and nature, and between humans and uh, uh, technology. 
So it is a sort of a, uh, everything is interrelated and it's sort of a cosmic whole in many sense. So that's kind of the key takeaways that I have from uh, you guys, a wonderful 10 minutes uh, uh, introduction. So we move on to part two of this panel and we will start with the, uh, a presentation by uh, Professor Sakula from Univers University of Tokyo. Please, Osamu. Oh, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, the, uh, hello, the, my name is Osamu Sakura. So uh, just call me uh, Osamu. And the uh, greetings from uh, South Korea. Uh, well, uh, I really miss all of you to attend the uh, Cambridge. Well, uh, the uh, I, uh, my background is uh, science studies. I'm not a philosopher. So I will focus on the uh, my talk on the uh, how the such relationality can be observed in the uh, human robots or human AI relations. Well, uh, the uh, firstly, I would like to uh, see the a uh, couple of examples of the, how the known relationalistic views uh, uh, can be uh, observed in the uh, Western uh, singularity talk. The first example is the uh, Dr. Ray Kurzweil, the singularity is near. Uh, he focused on the, the consistency of the performance of the machines at all times. And uh, he also continued it can be, well, it can consistently perform at peak levels and can combine peak skills that he uh, idealized a machine's performance. And the second example is uh, Nick Bostrom, the super intelligence. They, uh, he said, uh, wrote that the uh, other animals and humans have stronger muscles and sharper claws, but we have uh, clever uh, brains. I think it's a quite uh, one of the typical view of the uh, human beings are quite uh, very weak uh, read uh, views. And many of the uh, natural sciences uh, had the, so the anti uh, evidence that the human beings are such uh, weak. And uh, Nick Bostrom continued that the, uh, only a small portion of evolutionary selection on Earth has been selection for intelligence, human intelligence. So uh, he emphasized the human intelligence can be uh, com completely uh, different from the uh, other uh, uh, non-human uh, animals uh, intelligence and, and so on. So uh, we can uh, summarize the, these tendencies, uh, the, uh, 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 the sum of the uh, Western non-relational uh, views uh, emphasize the humans are special creatures and different from other animals. And the machines work accurately or mechanically. And the uh, human AI, human robot uh, relation is in binary opposition or individualistic. So uh, I would like to, uh, what to say, deconstruct such uh, views. Well, so these uh, cultural biases may, such cultural biases may affect on the human robot relations and they may be reflected on the composition of uh, human, uh, human robot, uh, AI robot relations. So uh, this is quite the uh, typical image of the uh, composition of the humans and the robot can be put in the uh, what you say one and one uh, opposition uh, position opposition uh, uh, what you say uh, uh, compositions. And this is the uh, scene from the uh, French robot maker, I think. Uh, then the uh, this is another example of the uh, typical the uh, opposite uh, relations of the humans, uh, uh, the very famous factors and actors and the uh, one uh, AIs. And but in the uh, Japanese uh, scenes, uh, these relations uh, can be seen as quite a, in a different way. Uh, he's a quite a, a, a famous uh, robot uh, professor in Osaka University, uh, Professor Ishiguro, and he uh, is he has been making these uh, quite a, such similar uh, androids, and uh, he always uh, puts uh, his position in this way and not the opposite way to the, his robots in, in looking for the same way. And this is a, one of the uh, example, another example that the uh, very famous uh, YouTuber, uh, Japanese YouTuber explained the, uh, how the uh, one of the robots, uh, Pepper uh, was, does work. And he always uh, looking uh, to the uh, audience's direction. This, so this is this uh, uh, direction of the sea. Okay, so uh, such uh, direction of the viewing is rather similar to the what 
were described in the uh, ukiyo-e, uh, old styles uh, Japanese paintings. So many of the ukiyo-e uh, showed the uh, similar uh, direction between the mothers and the infant. In the uh, left side is the uh, mothers and the uh, infants shows the uh, uh, rainbows. And the in the uh, right hand, uh, the mothers and uh, his, uh, her infants shows the uh, chrysanthemum. And this type of the direction of the gazing that are totally different in the Western uh, discourses. So the Western pictures, uh, 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 shows the in the mothers and the uh, infant in the, in this case is and uh, the, the, the Jesus and the, uh, his mother was totally uh, so the different way completely different way so they didn't share the same direction of the gazing. Well, our Japanese psychiatrist Shuji Kitayama uh, pointed out uh, this type of the uh, uh, the direction of the uh, viewing is quite a. Uh, typical in the Japanese uh, ukiyo-e. Uh, so he called it, this is the viewing together uh, positions. And so the uh, mother and the uh, infant can share their, can share and some uh, confirm their uh, affirm affirmativity to, to, to share the, the third item. So this is quite the typical uh, way of the uh, communicate, indirect communication uh, between the Japanese, even in the uh, adults. So uh, the Kitayama uh, pointed out that about 30% of mother infant pairs painted in ukiyo -e gaze on the third item together. And these are quite uh, rare in the Western paintings. So uh, in summary, so in Japanese pictures, robots are AI designed for humans can function as a sort of the partners of the siblings uh, sharing in a uh, triadic interaction, the third items where subjective agents are nearly uh, equal. But uh, while in the Western world, the robot AI designed for humans can function as partners within a close to microcosm, but their place in the larger world and the nature of the relationship cannot be specified as equal or dominant subordinated. And so in Japanese cases, uh, the mothers and the infants are almost are quite are similar. So both of the uh, infants are even the uh, member of the uh, communities equals. But, but in, so in the uh, Japanese, uh, attitudes, the robots can be regarded as uh, anyway, the partner of one of the members of our uh, communities. But in the uh, Western uh, compositions, uh, there is no code to the, which is more uh, dominant or subordinate than humans between humans and robots. So, so when the in the uh, case in, in so when the uh, robots or the AIs are uh, uh, Clearly, the uh, subordinate and the human beings, so we they don't they do not need to care about it. But it but but the recently the, uh, the lot of development uh, about the robots and the AI and for example the chat GPT and so on. So the uh, they don't have the, any code to that they remain robots and the AIs can remain as almost the same as the human beings. So that was the uh, that would cause cause uh, a very um, cautious and the terrific uh, reactions to the AIs and robots. Okay, so the uh, few more, uh, there are a few more minutes. So the, I would like to point out that there are kind of, uh, might be a similar relation between the humans and uh, apes or the monkeys. This is quite uh, the typical uh, images of Jane Goodall, uh, chimpanzee uh, researchers have the, uh, to have the uh, uh, in, in, uh, intimate uh, relation with the chimpanzees. And uh, quite similar to the, this very famous uh, composition between God and the uh, Adam. And this is another picture of the, the uh, lady, a psychologist uh, using the, her gorillas. So they put in their uh, position in the opposite. But in the uh, Japanese researchers uh, put their uh, positions in the different way. So th this this lady uh, put her herself in, in within the troop within the troop of the Japanese macaques, and this uh, gorilla uh, researcher uh, put uh, put put his positions uh, in in the gorilla's side. And uh, this is another research of the chimpanzee. So the, all the, these are the same, uh, similar to the positions. So uh, it might be possible that the relation between humans and robots are, are some, 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 a somewhat a parallel with the relation of the humans and apes and monkeys. Robots and AIs can bridge the humans and machines. 
uh, apes and monkeys can breed the humans and animals. Both raw machines and animals are clearly different from the uh, human beings, but robots and uh, monkeys can uh, bridge interact both humans and to these uh, two, two machines and animals. So the, the, this relation, uh, human robots relation, the human ape relations can be had some some uh, similarities. So that might be uh, reflected some the uh, uh, nature uh, situations. So East Asian uh, view to the nature uh, can be more the forest based and holistic and harmonious uh, and the Taoism. So the Arabian is uh, the, the, the uh, uh, experts of these uh, situations. The continuity of humans and the nature are quite the uh, ordinal images in, uh, within the uh, Asian uh, countries. But in the Western uh, Judeo uh, cultural uh, 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 discourses, it's a total difference that the, the nature is quite uh, severe and harsh to the human beings. So the, the difference, so nature and the human beings are totally different. So the, uh, the sum of the East Asian uh, mentality is quite uh, uh, I mean, uh, quite uh, sympathy to, to, to the uh, technism, techno, uh, technology. So techno animism uh, can be uh, our uh, common uh, mentalities. Okay, so uh, that is uh, my uh, talk. Thank you very much. Great, thank you also uh, for keeping uh, keeping the time pretty pretty diligently. So, uh, so I I hope you guys all got the message. Like you know, one is human humans versus robot, uh, ver you know, and then the other the uh, Japanese way is human and robot in looking at things together, exploring the world together. So talking about partnership versus uh, subordination. Uh, anyway, so uh, that was fascinating. He's done a lot of research, uh, looking at the photos and images and then you know, on the internet. So, so he, he has an interesting paper. Uh, by the way, I think we did, uh, some, we did actually uh, give some homework <laughs> to all the participants in advance of the panel, including uh, Osamu's uh, a piece uh, that was published on his uh, key findings and stuff. So please look it up. Okay, so uh, Robin, please. Hi, um, yeah, Professor. Oh, yeah, can you hear next the page? No. So now I'm uh, provide another oh, um, uh, perspectives. So mainly from Taoist perspective, the perspective. So we can, we think about AI ethics. So ethics is not about the principles, norms, and uh, some sort of external orders to impose to environment, to person, to uh, technology. So, but we can see it's rather ethics is a capacity. It's a com capacity and uh, to tone the, to all beings, needs of all beings. So this is, I think it's very important. So then human rationality and the reason we grounded in somatic uh, perception and the relation of functions of all experience. So this is very important. That, so you can see a Chinese garden. I took this picture to think about the human beings just a part of and this nature. So with this whole framework, what number one I would think is, I will start with seeing is the fear. Okay, technology advances probably bring out human fear, but the Taoist, Taoist perspective is, but whether or not know, know this kind of sense of fear, I would see maybe it's a little bit um, too strong. I would say fear nothing because the, because the, ground base is the world is uncertainty. So they can find comfortable with uncomfortable situations because the human mind is working with uncertainty because things will be changed and the transformation is inevitable. So this is we want to see technology, AI, it's not threatened to human beings. Rather, Taoists will embrace and celebrate human creation. However, there is a distinction. Is this a view not lead to everything goes? Okay, so there is there is two poles. One pole is everything goes, everything can be justified, accepted. Or you you will see uh, no, only one 
universal standard for all. So the dollars that we'll see, no, we wanted to look at the two distinctions. One is the natural intelligence and, the, and the artificial stupidity. So certain times, a human being could create something stupid. Okay, it's not the enhanced human life and the well-being and the flourish, but lead to human beings to another direction. So where a second direct second distinction we want to do is is a quest for which is a genuine, uh, or you can see it's authentic to human life, human. Uh, beings and then what we want to look at what is just the satisfaction of a desire and the uh, will. So this is a very important distinction we will look at it. Then what will be Taoist uh, um, AI uh, ethical framework? So I will probably lead to, um, I would present this in two ways. First of all, I look at these images. I took these images, this in the mountain, uh, Laojun Mountain. So in the 90s, and uh, this local community building after this giant uh, statue called Laozi, which we usually consider is the founders of uh, Taoism. If you look at this, first you can see the eyes come, come down represent the humanity, a, a, a humility, right? Not the eyes up, but the seeds of two. There is a limits to human beings. Secondly, the one hand, one finger up, unity. Unity between heaven, earth, human beings, cosmos, all things. In the heart of his, his, uh, um, his clothes, that's in yang symbol. That's the change, that's the transformation. Of course, the left hand holds the scripture. It's a Tao Te Ching. And the, the, the text, the 5,000 words, most being translated into different language, compare, second, probably compared with Bible. So, so this is one thing that we can see in image, but then the conceptualize, I would like to use the Tao Te Ching and this term called the three, um, uh, three treasures of Tao. This is from Tao Te Ching chapter 67. First one is the compassion. Compassion Chinese is Ci, but we heard this in the morning all the, all the time. So how do we really think about or really practice compassion? Compassion is featured not just the human to human, but the human to all beings, all things. Then what exactly is, what is this compassion, um, how to guide, how to do it? It's we are looking at all beings, animals, plants. We think about what they need. What's they need in order to survive and flourish? Not is what is their nature uh, or what is the substance of beings. Animal trees don't have soul. If we look at just in that type of mentality to look at, but we rather think about what was the best for survival of the animals, the trees, the human beings, the cosmos, all things. Secondly, is that's okay. Secondly, we talked about the simplicity, but probably we talk about the uh, moderation. So we, the human life, the technology, AI, actually to make a human being more simple, being atoned, being aligned with nature and not being just a complicated human life. So that is, there is a different way we think about how do we think about a, a, a simplicity. Third is a humility. I want also to think about the humility. It's not simply just conceptually, not just we think about intellectual virtues. Humanity is embodied practice. This practice is grounded in your body, your body, and the, your uh, experience. So maybe something we can, the, in the Taoist uh, ideas also have another one called the Zhou, called the, the uh, suppleness. Because how your body allow you to see you have limitations. Just like the way you have a proprioception. Proprioception help us how much your body actually can go, right? So you, you're going hiking, you're going dance, Downhill, no matter how much you, your mind, your desire want to see, I want to go fast, but your leg is not a follow you, right? You, if you want to go too fast, your leg, your leg will be soft and then going to fall. So that is something we turn into our body's need and cultivate our body. Of course, this body is not a flesh. We body talk about the physical form and the energy flow and the spirit. 
So it's all comprehensive ideas. So one of the things we will think about the humility also like the tree, you have root, root in the in the in the uh, soil, but yet you flower, you are uh, growing toward the sun. But at the same time, when fall, when rain blows and you bend with it, but yet you're not broke. You bend, but you're not broke. So that is a very important uh, value and the Dao is the uh, present to us. So um, that's, uh, I will see that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Robin. Um, I think I, I certainly heed the call that we want to make sure that we don't create artificial stupidity. Um, and then, you know, we should stick to nat uh, natural intelligence. The three treasures that she talked about reminds me a bit of uh, the five tests of Maori principles. We heard about it earlier. So uh, anyway, so this is all the sort of ancient wisdom. Uh, once we, they've been reinvented and then can be also guiding uh, uh, overarching principles for us to think about technology today. So, okay, Peter, please. So I wanna come at things maybe a little bit differently than the other two speakers and look at two specific issues. One would be the nature of technological risk. And the other one is to look at how our relationship, this constitutive relationship that we now have emerging with artificial intelligence may be affecting qualities of human consciousness and in what way that's going on. And to hopefully connect that with issues about colonization of consciousness and the need to decolonize our participation in this relationship with AI. <laughs> One of the liabilities of looking at individual existent entities and events as ontologically primary as first order realities and looking at relationships as second order realities is we tend to conflate tools and technologies. And I would like to posit that we created a sharp distinction between those where tools are localizable products of human ingenuity. We build tools, we manufacture them. It could be smartphones, it could be books, it could be electricity grids, anything at different scales, but they're localizable. Tools are meant to serve particular human purposes. They augment human capabilities and tools can therefore be judged in terms of their task specific utilities and appropriately so. And with tools, we have exit rights. We can decide not to use tools or to use them, and we decide how we're going to use those tools. I would suggest that technologies are something different. Technologies are relational media. They're non-localizable systems of both material and immaterial practices in which we participate. We do not build technologies. Technologies emerge out of human interactions with both our natural environment and our immaterial environments, that is our conceptual linguistic environments, they emerge from them in much the same way that ecosystems emerge out of species interactions. But once ecosystems emerge, they also have a downward causal influence on species and species conduct. In much the same way, technologies emerge out of our human interactions and then have recursive effects on us as human beings. So they tend to shape us even as we're shaping them. The important takeaway from that is technologies can't be evaluated in terms of task specific utilities. They can only be evaluated in terms of how they're transforming human human and human world relationships. Now, what this distinction enables us to do is to look at what has been emerging over the last decade, 15 years as uh, AI ethics and AI guidelines as primarily being focused at tool risks the risks of whether inapt, inapt design or misuse by design. That's really about tools. And what we're looking for in addressing those are standards of conduct for both design and for use of these particular tools. Technological risks, I would posit, are something quite different. They're structural and they're relational. And we're really only just beginning to learn what the technological risks of AI are. We're really at the beginning of that. And if you talk to people who are coming from the tech world, the optimists, they're saying that you know, the only real risks that we face are opportunity risks. We're gonna be blocked by regulation. We're not gonna be able to have our imagined horizons you know, open as widely as they might otherwise. That's the biggest risk we face. Because if we don't do this, we're not gonna be able to address climate change. We're not gonna be able to address a lot of the human inequalities that we got because these tools are crucial to us moving forward on that, all true. If you're a pessimist, however, you're looking at this and you're saying, well, the liability is, is that we might end up with human de-skilling, with the obsolescence of human intelligence, with a perhaps an extinction of humanity. So we have two horizons, this sort of opportunity cost horizon of risk 
and then the existential risk. And in between, lots of stuff has opened up. Everything from looking at digital divides to look at algorithmic bias, uh, looking at the ways in which disinformation is transforming democratic processes and perhaps making democracy a mockery of itself. Uh, we look at all the stuff that's going on with geopolitically with AI arms race and so on. These are all related to these tool risks that I'm talking about. Now, in response, we can look at that and we can say, well, how do we deal with this as agents making use of these tools? How do we as communities that are being affected by these uses as patients of AI, how do we deal with that? All very important. But I think it's really important also to stand back and look at what the technological risks are. What are the structural relational things that are going on? And I'll just pick one, one part of this total big picture. And that's the way in which the global attention economy is working. So we now have a world economy in which much of the way in which goods, services, and opinions circulate are being affected by algorithmic systems. These systems are taking human values as we have expressed them in our intelligent engagement with one another and with the world around us, that's the data. And that's being synthesized with computational systems that analyze that data, figure out how to feed back to us what it is we desire, what we want. Good, you get good recommendation actions, you get recommendations for music and clothing goods and so on, that's all meeting with our particular desires and interests. It sounds like a pretty good thing. But in fact, the capacity that these algorithm systems have, their epistemic powers are also ontic powers. They're the powers to create the kinds of consumers and citizens and members of communities that are being fed back into us with our own values. And if we look at humanity, we look at the continued persistence of domestic violence. We look at continued persistence of ethnic violence. We look at hatred, we look at war. If we're just gonna scale up human values as they are now, I think that's a pretty scary prospect. So what do we do? We look at this situation where attention, human attention, is the basic fuel of the global economy. And that is not an ethically neutral exchange. It's not just that we give our attention to social media and so on, and that that's simply something in which we get access to services and better goods and so on and so forth. It's not simply an exchange on that level. There's an ethical level here. And that is, attention is our most basic human resource. Without attention, we can't make a difference in our own lives or our lives of anyone else. If we have an algorithmic system that has now become global, which is based on the capacity for attracting, holding, and exploiting human attention, then we're in a position where we are at risk of losing our most basic human right, our right to freedom of attention. Without freedom of attention, we have no freedom of intention. Without freedom of intention, it becomes a mockery to say that we could live in a democratic society or that we can actually even exercise ethical sensibilities. Because without freedom of attention, we actually are being immersed within the conditions that I would call an ethical singularity. We end up in a position where we don't even have the latitude to be able to engage in that most basic ethical art, which is the art of human course correction. So I think we're in a position now where in spite of all the great goods that are coming with artificial intelligence, looking at technology as a relational medium in which we are now immersed and transforming ourselves as human beings in terms of our existing values and our past values, it's really a clarion call to all of us to really start thinking in terms of developing truly intercultural and intergenerational values that are not common values. We do not need any more universal values to be foisted upon humanity. What we need are shared values, that is values in which everybody has a participatory share. So we look at something like a con uh, concept like equity. Equity in relational philosophical terms is not simple equality of opportunity. That you can measure in terms of purely quantitative metrics, how much access to education, how many years of education, how much income, how much, et cetera, all quantitative. Relationally understood, equity is a measure an aspirational measure of quality of inclusion. So that equity itself as a concept is one in which each culture, each generation could have a distinctive contributory share by saying, what are the terms of increasing the quality with which I and others of my community are being included within this dynamic? 
in which the real benchmark is achieving real diversity, where diversity is not just how many people from different backgrounds are informing the design process or the use practices and so on. It's really saying diversity itself is a relational quality. It's a measure of the degree to which the differences that are present are being activated as the basis of mutual contribution to sustainably shared flourishing. I think as we look forward, maybe what we want is to try to think in terms of values like diversity and equity, how we might cash those out as shared values in which intergenerational, international, intercultural input is really part of the constitution of those values as relational, where values are understood as modalities of relational appreciation. How we move forward together is going to depend on how we come together in terms of shared values. Thanks. Great, we we are doing really well um, on time. I was concerned that with this kind of a little dense <laughs> topic, you guys are gonna end up talking for a long time. So anyway. Jane has heard me before talking at length, so she knows how dangerous it can be. Right, so anyway, what what I was, was hearing is, is you know, I, I think you really convincingly uh, argued about the difference between tools and technologies. I really recommend people uh, reading uh, Peter's book. And then and I, I really like that one is localized and the other one is actually relational media. And then the relational media, which is technologies, is has this dynamic and entangled sort of um, mutual shaping and reshaping. You know, so they shape us, we shape them, and then vice versa. You know, you create a recursive uh, impact. So anyway, and the freedom of attention is another thing that uh, I like that term, and then that's important to to note. And of course, shared values versus common values. And then you advocate shared values, and you talked about diversity and equity. So anyway, so this is a lot of the uh, interesting uh, points that have been made. So we have about 15 minutes. Um, so uh, questions in the audience. Um, one, two, three. Uh, someone will pass the, yes. Well, thanks everybody on the panel for a lot of, um, I think, important uh, food for thought. Um, let me, you know, probe the three of you on one set of, I think, highly problematic binary oppositions that I think should be overcome in order to deliver, I think, on some of the relational aspects. So one is, I think, a problematic ghost of the West that was haunting all three talks. So everything that was said about the West as being individual as opposed to relational, uh, et cetera, et cetera, I think is historically inaccurate. Relational philosophies abound in the West. You know, Plato, Schelling, just giving you two random, Hegel, you know, they say exactly the same things. Of course, they have also been discussing then later in the 19th century, if you look at the, uh, at the period of Romanticism, when these Western philosophers are, you know, by in that sense of Western, discovering other traditions. But of course, even back in the days, ancient Greek philosophy was deeply entangled with uh, Indian traditions, you know, skepticism. So all, all of this is well studied. So uh, there's simply no such thing as the West as it was presented, right? This was essentializing essences. So I think not quite in line uh, with, you know, relationality. So I think relationality in short, right, uh, you know, the Taoist tradition and all of that is much more widespread than this, uh, than you made this look in that uh, kind of an opposition. And then similarly, so, you know, like, I agree with the relational entirely, but again, I think this is much more universal than you made it look by regionalizing it. And then uh, uh, to Peter, thanks for this very useful distinction between uh, tools and uh, technologies. I uh, termed this in my own work as technique versus technology. Uh, so I'm looking forward to reading this. A very useful way of putting this. I couldn't agree more also with respect to what this means for ethics of AI. Uh, but then, you know, just a little bit also about the, you know, common or sorry, shared versus universal. What's wrong with thinking about the universal as universalizing, as uh, Takahiro Nakajima calls it at the University of Tokyo? So why not think uh, of what you called the shared, the sharing and relationality, et cetera, as always already constituting universal value. Why think that the discourse of the universal is by its very nature, the type of problematic colonial discourse, et cetera, et cetera, that we rightly want to repudiate, right? So again, this, this belongs to just this aspect of, a, of what I found like a surprising binary opposition that I think needs to be overcome in order to really see 
you know, appreciate the identity and differences, if any, between what we call cultures. Peter, you want to address these two questions? We did discuss it in our pre-discussion, sure. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more about the uh, needing to avoid essentializing any cultures, any philosophical systems and so on, because obviously you can look at uh, Levinas and, you know, constitution of ethics with the other. So, you know, we don't want to uh, create too much in the way of caricatures. But I think it is also useful to create some clear distinction between the philosophical approaches to relation out that you might find in some Western traditions from those in Asian traditions. So let's just take Plato as an example. Plato is really looking at identifying those universal ideas, ideals, the good, as a, the typical one. And that is supposed to be something that is, in a way, atemporal. It's not part of the sense system. It's not part of our body-mind system. This is something that we intuit as a universal, as an idea. And you can debate that whether Plato really meant this or not. I mean, there's lots of new scholarship rehabilitating Plato and saying he really wasn't talking about this. But that is how it has come down through much of the tradition understood. Whereas in the Asian tradition, especially the Buddhist tradition, in epistemic terms, there is no distinction between the knower and the known. The relationship between the known and the known is a transforming relationship over time in which both the known and the knower are necessarily transformed. So it's a dynamic relationship. So there's a bit of a tension between any kind of a universal that would posit something that is atemporal or that lasts forever. That there is a sense in which we are really talking about evolving sets of concepts where concepts are distillations of relational dynamics. They're not things that are abstract at all. These are manifested in our relational dynamics. So I think that the idea that there is a non-dualistic epistemology behind the Asian constitution of relational philosophy and what we've seen in traditions that have come out of Europe and the Americas and so on, and have been spread and now have become global. I think that you could create a distinction and say it's really important to understand the dynamic nature of relationality at that that's really constitutive. Maybe somebody like Hegel gets closer to that because in his master-slave dialogue, it really is a dynamic relationship and it's ongoing. So I think that's one part of it. Uh, but this idea that uh, the practices are not detemporalized, that what we're looking for is sharing over time. So in Hawaii, we have potlucks. Maybe you have potlucks here. If everybody brings the same thing to a potluck, you only bring rice, it's a terrible potluck. If you only bring dessert, it's a terrible potluck, unless you're like my wife who loves desserts. But basically, you want everybody to bring something different. And what's important about it is, is the, the way in which those differences actually mesh. So I think we're talking on the same terms. We're really trying to figure out what are the terms of productive differentiation. And that's really what's crucial. We don't want to collapse and say the West is all one thing or Asia is all one thing. What we want to do is actually intensify those differences in ways that are increasingly productive. Yeah. So that very quick, add a couple of things. Thank you very much for your this view. And the, I think you're right. So there is no dichotomy Western and East because in the Western, you, you will have you do have a relationality. But I do want to give two cases since you you mentioned Plato and uh, Hegel. So I want to very quickly let's take a Plato's view of the cave. Right, the cave. The most of things being in, it's it's about the light. You going to, you live the dark ignorance, and then you go to reason. You you receive the light, but that's different than Taoist idea. Taoists think the the eye actually confused you. Where are you going to do? Do your stomach. You there is eyes of the stomach because the stomach know your limits. Your eye, all you can eat, you never stop. Your eyes still want the, the stomach. See, stop, right? Stop. Stomach give you a a this kind of that to truly let you know your body keep the score. The body have the budget. Okay, secondly, you talk about the Hegel. Let's think about the Hegel's absolute spirit. Hegel talk about that uh, dialectic movement. Yes, senses, anti-senses, so forth. But it's still very different than Chinese idea of yin-yang interaction because that's for Hegel only in the mind and in somewhat, but in the in young ideas is manifested in the all beings, all things. And so that is, it's, and also it's not a closed circle. It's always in the open. So, because for, for Hegel's absolute spirit, eventually you have, a, you reach the ideal stage. 
over there that that you get the perfection. That's the, a circle. But in uh, in Yang, it's not a circle. It's a spiral movement, never end. Okay. Uh, can I have a, a very short, quick comment? Yep, wonderful, please. Okay. Uh, actually, so uh, I, I couldn't agree more with the uh, question from the followers. So thank you very much for the very important point. Uh, I made the uh, the last slide for my uh, caveat, but uh, I uh, omitted because the time limit. So uh, there is the uh, the perspectives presented here are overly simplified schematic. So I we should avoid such uh, simplified dichotomy, of course. So the uh, Besides from the uh, irrationality and essentialism and so on, so the uh, human robot or human uh, tools uh, relations are very different within uh, East Asian uh, countries. We, we share a lot of the uh, uh, features, but we also uh, can observe the uh, differences uh, within the East Asian countries. And so that is the one of the reasons why I'm here in these uh, school years. Uh, so the, uh, the other part is they also they are Peter and Robin. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe in the interest of time, can I uh, have the second, uh, this lady has a question right earlier. Oh, yeah, maybe maybe we round up like say three questions, maybe. Let's round up three questions and then uh, all of you dress and then we end. Oh, yeah. Okay, would that be okay? Push. I think you're gonna all ask a Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, if you can elaborate a bit more how relationality philosophy differs from the actor, actor network theory by Bruno Latour, that will be my first one. And then my second question has to do with attention. It was a fascinating description of, of how attention is perhaps the hottest commodity right today. However, I have a slight disagreement with this view of attention as being somehow up for grabs because it decentralizes the human being and it uh, disempowers the human being to such a degree that it sounds almost like human beings are these animals who do not know where to direct their gaze. And then these companies or whatever intelligence is just capture our attention, right? Where is the, where is free will? Where is kind of intentionality on the human level from this point of view? Thank you. I, I believe that young man had a question, yeah. Now to you. Um, I have a special question for Peter. Also because um, since the 1960s we have witness a uh, surge um, that's practice or uh, theories that centered on relations such as um, ANT and also rhizomes by uh, Deleuze or in art, there is a relational aesthetics. In technology field, there's a system, systems theories or global networks. So I'm wondering, will you be afraid of that um, the relation we create one day be appropriate um, by a society of control? that based on relations uh, generating or deducting, for instance, the interperson uh, interpersonal relationship data deducting by machine intelligence also contributes to the surveillance capitalism, or is there any uh, a quality of connection we create? Have you ever questioned the relations that we create is not neutral? Thank you. I know my question is way more simple, but what is like to talk a little bit more about the difference between common and shared values for me is not that much clear. Here you start, maybe. The common shared, I would refer you to Jean-Luc Nancy, who is the source of my way of using this distinction between the common and the shared. But essentially he says that the common, especially when you're talking about in terms of cultural values, always comes with a coercive element that his reference point is Nazi Germany and the invocation of a common folk culture of the Germans. So the German people have a common culture. And so for Nazi, that always has a coercive dynamic, whereas he's talking about shared and it actually works the same way in English and French, that it's some, a contributory process in the same way you share a dance. If you're doing the same thing, dancing with one another, you're stepping on each other's toes. So sharing implies a difference that's internal to that relationship. I think that that connects with this question that was posed about uh, the nature of different qualities of relationship, whether relationships are always mutual or not. 
And I think with Osama's presentation and looking at the, the mother-child pictures, I mean, one thing that you could look at is his direction of gaze. But another thing is it's a different kind of intimacy that's going on with child rearing in those environments. So that we, as those of us who are parents, fortunate enough to be parents, you learn how to become a parent from your child. And each child is different. I have two sons and I'm a different father with both of them. So my relationship with them is not one thing. Fatherhood is not one kind of relationship. It's constituted differently because of the people who are sharing in that relation. So it's always ongoing. It's always kind of asymptotic. You never get there. You're never fully a father. You're learning how to be a better father or mother or friend over time, progressively. There's no essential definition of what it means. So it's really crucial then to look at what are the qualities of relational dynamics that we're involved in. And one of the tensions, though, I think, between not to essentialize the West, but there has a long history of neoliberal thinking in which equality is a primary value. So equality of opportunity, equality of access to resources, et cetera. Whereas from a Buddhist perspective, there is no equality. Equality is an abstraction. You know, equality with respect to what? With respect to income? years of education, okay, we could talk about that, as long as you specify equality with respect to what. But what we're really talking about is relationships that are always, in one way or another, hierarchic. The question is whether they're perniciously hierarchic. A relation between parents and children is not non-hierarchic. It isn't. And yet, what is the quality of that relationship? Teacher-student, you know, ruler, you know, and subjects in a traditional Confucian world, the question is, what's the quality of the relationship? And so I think that we don't have a real good vocabulary for talking about quality. You're a citizen or you're not a citizen. What does it qualitatively mean to be an exemplary citizen, an exemplary parent, an exemplary friend? And that is, I think, where the ethics of an open-ended pursuit of relational quality, continually enhancing relational quality in terms of all the specific kinds of roles and relationships that we all have, and which are continually changing. So it's not as if you come up with a set principle and you operate according to it and try to bring everything into line with that. Rather, it's an open-ended pursuit of increasing quality of inclusion and relational dynamics, increasing capacity for relating freely, perhaps. Let me leave Robin a chance. In. Um, the, given the time, I think the questions actually um, raised the, the two issues. I think these issues can, has uh, some sort of um, opposites. One is the idea of a free free will. So being talked about. So free will uh, uh, ultimately think, do we have individual agency here, right? Another issue talk about the relationality, uh, the problem with the relationality. Then I do think there is a limits of relational philosophy. I'm not saying relational philosophy has has its own problems. The problem is free will issues. How do we respect individuals' uh, uh, freedom, individuals' uh, uh, choice, and at the same time attend the two relations in this context? So I think maybe uh, this is my solution. I see these two poles. I see the two problems. But I would think maybe we call the rooted uh, free will, which the root is re relationships. Uh, it's, it's because of free will, you will think about it. There's any free will actually is embedded or derive from your culture, your tradition, and your social standard. You shaped by it. Right? So I usually talk about people think about, oh, you have, you know, you all have a sweet tooth. You want a chocolate in the pie, but I have a rice tooth because I always eat the rice. They never give me, I grew up, nobody feed me uh, a pie and uh, cakes. They only feed me oranges as a dessert, right? So that I free will choose that a chocolate or free will choose that a rice is result of culture, result of relationality. But at the same time, relationality has to think about the, about the each individual in a different soil, different sunshine, different uh, uh, con environmental conditions, and come up with different uh, uh, plants and the flowers. So that might be a way to solve this is a problem and the tension. Great, thank Can you. I just quickly yeah. get to the freedom of attention exactly. one. Yeah, the the Bukuna Lakshmi question. Yeah. Do we still have like two or three minutes yeah. to address um, that? One minute. One minute, minute. please. Okay. Just one minute. 
Um, I don't know as much about actor network theory as I should, but my impression is that with a lot of the deconstructionist thought that comes out of Deleuze and follows forward, there's still a, a slight tendency to interpret the person as individual and to see the network relationships as being contingent as opposed to constitutive. I mean, that's an arguable point philosophically. But I think that where it comes down um, to something really important is how we understand freedom and freedom of attention. And I think one of the things that's most difficult to get a handle on is the way in which the current attention, the algorithmically driven attention economy, and there's always been attention economies, religious rituals are part of attention attraction. So on dressing like this is attention, you know, in Hawaii, we don't use jackets like this. This is for you guys. Um, but there's a difference between the systems that are now giving us what we want. The systems are getting better and better at, at figuring out what it is that I want, how it's different from what you want, and giving us individually what it is we desire, things that we will say accord with my choices. So greater freedom of choice is being something that's promulgated by these systems. And that sounds on the one hand really great. On the other hand, it's frictionless freedom of choice. Nothing you need to do, all you need to do is log on, do a keyword search, bang, you get suggestions. And that's very different from a Buddhist ideal of freedom, which is about relating freely, which has to do with effortful practice. It requires long-term effortful practice to be able to be free in the Buddhist context, whereas freedom of choice is a pretty low bar. And I think we sold ourselves too low as a society on freedom of choice, as opposed to trying to create the conditions in which AI could help us to relate more freely through effortful practices and more finely attuning our attention to the needs of those around us. Great. On that note, we are close to today's panel. Thank you guys so much. Thanks. Thanks. Well, thank you.